Okay. Welcome, dear all uh, panelists and guests. I'm very happy to welcome you to today's event. That is the first event of uh, the Swedish Society of Medicine Students and Junior Doctor Sections Global Health Week 2021. So the event of today is Global Health Equity, a panel discussion. And I'm very, very happy to uh, present our panel, uh, Miguel San Sebastian, Anton Lager, Hanna Jandal, and, and Olena. And tonight, um, we will start with uh, individual presentations uh, of our panelists, and then we will move on to uh, the panel discussion. Uh, so this is the plan of the evening. Uh, we will have a small health break in the middle, so uh, you have time to, uh, to take a glass of water, a cup of coffee, or anything you need. Um, okay, I think we can start right away, actually, with the individual presentations. So I want to welcome uh, Hanna Jandal to start. Thank you, Hedda. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that I could share my screen. Do you all see it now? Yes, okay, perfect. Um, so a bit of a last minute for me as well, because I guess these time, a lot of uh, viruses uh, going through, uh, except for COVID-19. And uh, we had um, a few panelists who could not join us tonight, uh, sadly, but uh, I will try to give you just a short background on um, uh, global health and uh, social determinants and health. Uh, and uh, let's see if I can change. There we go. So for the introduction, first of all, who am I? Well, I think this is a really important question to ask yourself when you're working in global health in general um, or <laughs> in your everyday life, whatever you work with. Um, but especially when you work with questions that might uh, be ethically uh, tricky sometimes, or uh, you really have to make sure uh, who, who am I uh, in this position and what role should I have, which background uh, do I come from and what do I bring into this topic. Uh, I'm a medical doctor and I'm a PhD student in infectious diseases at Umeå University. Uh, and I'm also certified in human rights and disaster medicine trainer from the IFMSA. So that's the background I'll try to bring to you today. Uh, so first of all, what is health? Well, I guess that most of you might know that if you're here listening today. Uh, but if you just look at the WHO definition, health is a state of complete physical and mental and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And this is probably not new for you. Um, but then again, what is mental health? Uh, and just to be on the same platform for tonight's discussion, I'll give you the next definition. Uh, so a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, work productively and fruitfully, and contribute to his or her community. And I give you a little question there. And have these aspects been affected for you, yourself, during the pandemic? I guess for many of the patients I meet every day, they have been for sure. And then again, global health, what is it? Uh, so it's discussed also among people working in it, but this is somehow a uh, official definition of it. I'll leave it there for you to read, but this is the definition of Copland et al. Um, but it's um, study research and practice. Uh, and here, we'll, so you can see the word equity in health for all people worldwide, right? Um, and you can also ask yourself, what is then public health? Well, they have some things in common. Um, here we see the words protect, maintain, and improve the health of a population by organized means. You have these preventive programs, uh, education programs, different interventions. And I think this is also something important to keep in mind in today's discussion, like when you look at research and um, uh, possible interventions. 
And um, also to add that it can also be combined with, for example, engineering, architecture, biology, social science, ecology, and economics. And then the question of tonight, health equity. Uh, and um, I'm sad that we don't have time to, to bring all in all your different comments, but uh, anytime you're free to give a comment uh, in the chat, if you have questions or, or if you would like to answer the questions. But I keep on moving because time is, is short tonight. And um, you might have seen this picture before. Uh, what is equity in a person with equality? So uh, when we look at health equity, the definition is that it's defined as the absence of unfair and avoidable or remittable differences in health among population groups, defined socially, economically, demographically, or geographically. Okay. Um, so then we have the social determinants of health. Another important thing to keep in mind for this discussion. So these are like all the different aspects that might affect a person's health, right? As you see in the middle here, you have the individuals, perhaps family, friends and such. You have the individual lifestyle factors, perhaps exercise or uh, the use of drugs or not, um, the kind of food you're eating, etc. You have social and community networks, and then all around these different aspects that might affect your health, uh, food security, water and sanitation, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, and um, yeah, for example, so you can say that education is really important. And I, I know that Miguel has been working with these aspects, for example, uh, unemployment and job security, uh, working life conditions, housing, basic amenities and an environment and climate, of course. Uh, and uh, as I am a disaster medicine uh, trainer, I'm particularly interested in how these aspects are um, affected in a disaster. And then you can imagine that depending on how uh, vulnerable a society or a person is, uh, the disaster will be very different uh, depending on the country, uh, the region, uh, and these uh, social determinants of health in that specific community. Hello, you should give me a heads up if we're uh, running out of time. Um, so the health effects on natural disasters can be wide reaching as said, uh, and these are perhaps the most obvious things that can be affected like food and water safety, uh, but also infectious diseases uh, after disaster. Um, the absence of vaccine, for example, and of course, mental health effects. So you can say that social determinants of health, they're a bit like risk factors. Um, they can be hazards. And uh, you have them here, a picture of different um, health hazards um, and also the different forces that can affect these, um, these aspects. Uh, everything from politics to social policies uh, and uh, development agendas. Uh, and speaking about that, especially if you're working in a disaster medicine setting, uh, you also have to think about um, uh, aspects like army and um, and yeah, whatever organization or uh, sector you have to uh, collaborate with in a specific situation, and that they all affect health in different ways. We also have the Agenda 2030, uh, which you are, might be familiar with, uh, with a specific goal for health, uh, the goal number three. But um, from what we've just been talking about, you can see that these different aspects all affect uh, health in one way or another. Uh, and just to give you a few barriers to healthcare. Uh, this is a good structure to use, I think, or it has helped me many times as a clinician, the AAAQ. Uh, so is the healthcare available in sufficient quantity? For example, do we have um, enough of staff? Um, and uh, can the patients reach the essential medicines? And you can read some of the examples here. Let's see if I can change picture there. The next one is accessible uh, and they can be accessible in different ways. Is it financially accessible? Uh, can I afford healthcare? Um, and also the basis on discrimination. 
so if a person is refused medical treatment because of, for example, HIV or um, HBTQ, HBTQ, for example, if, uh, if you have a different culture or religion. Uh, and then just specific health related information, if it is um, given in a way which is understandable for you as a patient, the right language or your specific dialect. Then we have uh, the third, acceptable. Uh, so here again, uh, you can have this uh, culture um, example. If uh, uh, people from a specific ethnic minority, uh, they might not make use of uh, the hospital because in their specific culture, you shouldn't have um, toilets in the hospital. Something I've met when I've been working abroad, for example. Uh, and then perhaps um, um, extreme example, but still present that uh, people from a specific group uh, might uh, um, be sterilized during family uh, planning uh, in different regions in the world. And as you might be aware of historically also in Sweden. I'm sorry, we need to uh, wrap it up. Perfect. So I'll give you the last one then, quality. Uh, so uh, is the healthcare given in the right quality? Uh, are there resources? Um, so for example, in some regions, uh, the medicines available are expired. And also knowledge, do we have enough staff that are trained for these specific settings, for specific operation, etc. So when thinking of uh, health equity, just keep in mind that it's broad and there are many different levels and aspects to it. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much, Hannah. And um, a very good like, kind of orientation and introduction to many um, uh, words and, uh, and concepts that will be discussed much more, I'm sure. Thank you so, so, so much. Very happy to have you here. Okay, I pass the word to Miguel. Can you see the screen? Sorry. Yeah. Yes, we can see the screen. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so my name is uh, Miguel San Sebastian, and um, I work at the Department of Epidemiology and Global Health at Tumio University. And I have a background in medicine and then moved to public health, uh, with, uh, mainly training in, in Latin America. Uh, and in the context of, uh, in our department, we have two two, let's say, specialized groups. One is uh, related to, to social inequalities in health, which is under the umbrella of this uh, Observatory for Equity in Health and Healthcare. And the other one is much more focused, recently formed in, in relation to uh, research and education for SAMI health. So these are the, and these are the two groups I, I belong to. And my, my plan is will be you to give a, a very short uh, idea about the work we are doing uh, in Norland related to social inequalities in health. As you probably know, social inequalities is a, in health is a fascinating uh, like discipline or field, but it's as well very complex because it involves a lot of uh, concepts and theories uh, and is linked to other, to other fields as well. Uh, and it's very dynamic where a lot of things are happening uh, in, in, in very short time. And, and it's challenge as well because, uh, because it's, it's difficult to measure some, some of the concepts that, that, that in theory, they look very nice. And, and as well, because has social is, is political too. So it has a lot of these components. Uh, let's see if this moves. Yeah, oh, well, just to a quick remind or remind you where, what is, uh, sorry where is uh, Norland, and then we, when we call Norland, and even politically, it's not like that, maybe, but uh, we cover these four regions, no? the Norbot, Investorbot, Investor Norland, and, and, and Jemtland. This is the web page of our, of our group. Um, and the, the, the aim that we have in the group is, on one hand, to, to monitor socioeconomic inequalities in health, uh, to focus on a specific inequalities that we think they are important, and try to reveal which are the determinants of those inequalities, and then uh, to make this uh, this information somehow 
uh, ready for the policymakers to, to, to be used. And we have a strong collaboration with the four regions in Norland and with the public health agency of Sweden, so with the four health in the head, so in different, in different aspects. We have um, I put here an example, but we have four main data sources that we use. One is the the the, the survey that uh, that uh, for health the head conducts every four years in Norland, uh, via, um, uh, every two years in in Sweden, uh, which is called um, Health on Equal Terms, uh, Health Apolica Vilkor in Swedish. Uh, we have a specific survey that we have uh, conducted this year for the Sami population. Uh, based on, on the same health and equal terms in this health apolica uh, We have uh, conducted a specific uh, surveys uh, in relation with uh, some commission work from the For Health of the regarding uh, uh, youth clinic surveys among users of sexual and reproductive health rights among migrants. And these are uh, yeah, the strong pillars, I would say, of our work in terms of uh, social inequalities in, in health. I'm going to present you now uh, some examples of, of these four lines that we work. Uh, on one hand, as I said, is monitoring with the social inequalities, so to present the social inequalities in two fields, in health outcomes and in health care, in access to health care. Um, and then I'm going to present you, I think, three or four examples. Um, this third area that we wor work quite a lot is in to reveal or to identify what kind of determinants uh, explain those social inequalities, uh, both in health and in healthcare. And the final one is uh, something that is uh, comes from the field of intersectional studies, what sometimes we call complex social inequalities. But we have started to to dig a little bit more in in this um, in this field in order to to again to identify which kind of groups are more vulnerable regarding health and healthcare. And I will put some examples. Okay, so the first one is about uh, social inequalities in health, and this is a study that uh, we conducted uh, among uh, popular young people that were attended the uh, uh, youth clinics in in Sweden, and then uh, sorry in Norland, and then the idea was to to see if how they rated the the friendliness of the youth clinics based if they were Swedish or they were uh, with a foreign background. So we look at the kind of uh, uh, ethnic. Uh, inequality in terms of the, the the access to the to the youth clinics. The second example is a geographical example, uh, and then we have map. For instance, this is the the, the prevalence of obesity by the different municipalities in uh, in Norland uh, in 2006, 10, and 14. Um, and then you can see uh, in, the, in the green represent a bit the low. Uh, prevalence of obesity and the red one is a high prevalence of obesity and you can see over time how the prevalence of obesity has been increasing in the different municipalities now this is a way to to show to the for instance policy policy makers where they should intervene more more specifically for which which kind of municipalities because even if norland can be considered quite homogeneous you can see as well that it's not so homogeneous when we when we look at health uh, the third example is a bit more complicated, but it uh, reflects as well trends in, uh, in different uh, socioeconomic inequalities. I just put an example of mental health capture with three indicators, stress, depression, or uh, psychosocial distress, which is measured by the general health questionnaire. And then here is represented uh, different trends regarding education and income. And if I summarize this information, we can see that among men, for instance, um, there has been a quite stable income inequality or increased income inequality, while there has been a kind of decreased education inequality. In women, we see that there has been a decrease both uh, in income and educational inequality over time in these three uh, outcomes that I can mention. So this is the, the data that come from Helsa Polika Vilkor. So they can serve as well for uh, monitoring over time. The uh, fourth example, but related to identifying social inequalities in healthcare comes from this study where we assess something that is called horizontal inequity. It's this, it's this meaning uh, uh, that you have uh, to the same uh, need you should have independently of, soci of, of socioeconomic inequalities, you should have the same care. Um, and then we, we see again trends 
and, and we measure this with an indicator that is called specific indicator to capture um, inequality in access to healthcare, which is called horizontal inequity index. And we can see that over time, the and then zero means no inequality, and above one means that inequality that is favoring the rich, and above one is uh, inequality that's favoring the, the poor. And the inequalities in specialist visit and hospitalization over time has been reduced, but inequalities in terms of uh, visiting primary healthcare doctors are increasing. So the, the, the rich are using more the doctor for the same need compared to the poor. This is what we have been observing. Um, the third one is about the determinants of social inequalities. This analytically is a bit more complex, but the idea is that uh, how, to, how to be able to identify which kind of determinants explain the, um, the educational or the income inequalities. And this is a study that we did with uh, access to healthcare, uh, youth clinics, and, and uh, general practitioner visits among young people uh, based on income. So it's income inequalities. Uh, but the, what we are interested in is what explained the difference that existed in access between the rich and the poor young people. And here there are different factors explaining uh, uh, the different inequalities. We don't need to enter into detail, but this is another approach that is very important in the health in uh, social inequalities and health field, because try to identify which kind of factors explain the inequalities to, so the policymakers can intervene on those, on those factors in order to reduce the, the social inequality in, in health. And the, the final one refers to uh, intersectionality and what might be called this complex social inequalities. And there is this particular study apply one framework that is used by, it's called Jackson, Jackson uh, framework, what uh, plays with some, uh, um, so that intersect in different, different social, social uh, variables. In this particular case, we put together education and sex. So we have Instead of having separately education and separately sex, we have uh, uh, educa high education, high educated men and women, low educated men and women. So you have four categories put together, and then we can measure the, the, the complexity and the differences that, that exist in the different groups and measure through some specific con uh, concept, which are called joint preference or excess inequality. And here, and then here we show the crude one and the adjusted one. Um, yeah, and finally, I have just some, some kind of uh, reflections uh, that we have been discussing here, and they are, we are not very clear either. But I mean, in general, uh, policymakers here are well accepted the, this initiative that we have, the, the, this, um, this observatory. But there is questions about who should monitor, and uh, it's a question about funding, who, who should fund this. Um, uh, is this really um, socioeconomic inequalities in health a priority for policymakers or not? Or is just a discourse? And and how how to make the best? And how can we transmit um, the best information to policymakers in order to act? And often, even if we deliver that information, we are not very clear about how policymakers uh, uh, receive that information, how they apply it. So um, this can be issues that we somehow reflect all the time about what what to do with that with that information that could be something that to yeah to discuss later thank, thank you. you very much miguel very interesting presentation and exciting to hear about your work thank you uh we pass the word to olena Thank you. Uh, I decided to share some slides. Uh, Hannah, I have a project on uh, migrants and tuberculosis, and I thought I would share one of my presentations with you because it's a um, suitable topic to discuss. Just a second. I will find it, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Do you see? Yes, we do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks a lot. So thank you for inviting me. I, I would like to warn everyone that I've been invited just a couple of hours ago as a, a backup speaker. And um, uh, still I'm very happy that you remembered about me. And uh, I thought on this uh, equity and healthcare, I will take up a topic that I, um, I had a project on this topic uh, funded by Swedish Institute. It's not exactly the topic that I'm working all the time with, but um, a very interesting issue. So it has to do with labor migration and tuberculosis. 
labor migration, you know, this is the phenomenon when people migrate to do certain type of work and normally it's because they want to earn more money in other countries, international labor migration can be also inside of the country, but I will talk about international within Europe. So, and why I'm talking about this, I am in fact a molecular biologist and I work a lot now with bacteria and metabolomics and tuberculosis is my special interest. Um, however, I am an activist and I'm also a, a vice chair in the tuberculosis network in Europe. Uh, uh, so due to my engagement in this, I apply and won a grant from the Swedish Institute that was looking at tuberculosis in migrants, because I think this is an important uh, question and together with my network and colleagues who have been looking at that. Uh, so thanks again to the Swedish Institute for this possibility. Uh, and uh, let's see what happens here. Uh, Europe is the largest region globally for the labor migration. Not everyone knows about that, but if uh, you look from the data from uh, International Labor Organization, you will see that 32% of all the migrants, uh, work migrants, which are many people, it's uh, globally 164 million people who move to receive a job, they are in Europe. So here where we live, and these are million people. And in connection to tuberculosis, that's also interesting because tuberculosis uh, is unequally distributed across who uh, WHO European region. So, you know, WHO divides globe in regions and European region has 53 countries. And across those countries, uh, tuberculosis is distributed very much unequally. The incidence differs dramatically if you look at this map, right? Do you see that? So Eastern Europe shines high here, but of course, Sweden is not so much uh, affected by tuberculosis anymore as it's been in past. And there is another map from ACDC, I think from our center for infectious disease, um, uh, which shows the percentage of the um, tuberculosis among migrants. And that also, if you look at the European Union, is a high percentage because uh, while in the population inside of the country, tuberculosis has been defeated, uh, it's still high incidence among people from who migrated from other countries, including also Eastern Europe, even though uh, it's not always the case. For example, in uh, Sweden, we see tuberculosis in people from Poland also, and then the Eastern Europeans um, uh, migrate to Poland and then to Sweden. And I, I am Ukrainian by origin, so I've been specifically interested in the very um, large phenomena that has been happening recently. Ukrainians have been migrating to work. This is my red arrow showing uh, this country is Ukraine and neighboring country is Poland. So in recent um, seven years or so, um, two or, uh, about two million Ukrainians migrated for work in Poland. And the incidence of tuberculosis in Ukraine is 77 people uh, per 100 population, and in Poland is 15. So it's several times difference in the incidence. So the question would be if it's affecting the situation, and uh, why would we think about in the terms of uh, healthcare equities? Because uh, even the, uh, the language would be similar, and uh, countries are very close. But people who are labor migrants or foreigners, they wouldn't have the same access to the treatment diagnostic uh, as locals. And this is what we have been seeing. seeing. Uh, in, on a bigger scale, I would like to say that each country in European Union has its own healthcare system. And if you think about the labor migrants, uh, it's very difficult if you move from country to country to, to say, let's wait, where I'm now in Poland, in Sweden. So what should I have to receive my health care? Uh, every country would put different, different things on you. You will have to show this and this. Here's insurance. Here's not insurance. This disease, tuberculosis, in many countries covered, but not in everyone. In some countries, you will be deported if you have tuberculosis. In Latvia, if someone when, will find you on the border with tuberculosis, you will go home. You will treat your tuberculosis. Then you probably can come back. Not like this in Poland. In Poland, everyone who is found with tuberculosis will receive treatment. 
for free. But on the other hand, they're not going to look for you. They're not going to actively search for your tuberculosis like they do in Ukraine, for example. So Ukraine and Poland, two uh, insights, very similar countries with language wise, also very similar. Uh, and then a huge migration starting from 2008 and going through 14 revolution in Ukraine, social events, poverty in the country, so they move for a better life. There's no visa between uh, Ukraine and European Union. So uh, basically Ukraine is the largest group in the world migrating in the recent years. Uh, and so you will see that the, the curve of the tuberculosis incident between uh, Poland and Ukraine is very similar, the shape of the curve. But the difference in the incidence is huge. Uh, mortality, for example, in Poland, uh, about 500 people die of tuberculosis. But in Ukraine, it's over 5,000 people who die of tuberculosis uh, yearly. Uh, so um, you can say that the curve probably everywhere is the same. No, it's not the same. Uh, here is a Swedish curve. And uh, um, then this is German curve for tuberculosis incidence over the years. So definitely the, the Polish uh, curve uh, is connected to Ukraine. And if you see at the map of Poland, the incidence of tuberculosis is high at the border of Ukraine. And then if you look at the highest top of migration, the decline of the incidence of tuberculosis in Poland stopped when the Ukrainians started to migrate there. So the conclusion, what I would like to say, that definitely when people migrate, especially labor migrants actively uh, going back and forth to different countries, uh, they, have, uh, they might have their own diseases specific to their country. Now, generally speaking, I was talking specifically about tuberculosis, but it can be whatever other disease endemic uh, or prevalent among a special uh, group of people. So um, if we want to have equities to the healthcare, then we should address the needs of those groups of people. And sometimes these groups of people are millions of people and you have to, to do something about that if you really want to have an uh, equal coverage. The vulnerable groups may not be uh, covered by diagnostic. Migrants are vulnerable groups. They're people on the move, they're vulnerable groups. And then you need to think in the systematic changes, structural changes, how you provide them with diagnostic and care. So uh, in conclusion, we need labor migration. This is the motor of our region. Uh, and then we also have TB elimination goals, early diagnostic and treatment. Uh, but then we have countries with variety of healthcare policies that no one understands. If you're just a simple person moving from country to country, how you can understand? So the, uh, with this unequal distribution of tuberculosis, we would really need to address the needs of all the groups if we really want to address all the goals and also have a um, healthy uh, migrating uh, workers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elena, for this very interesting presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, I will pass the word to our last speaker of today, uh, Anton, welcome. Thank you. I guess I'm presenting now. Yes, yes you are. We are seeing your presentation and we're hearing you well, thank you. Great. So I'm Anton Nager, I'm a public health epidemiologist at uh, Region Stockholm. Uh, and we've had a busy year and a half as the region of Stockholm is uh, among the 20% of regions in Europe, struck the hardest by COVID-19, sacrificed perhaps by the national government, I don't know. Um, I've, I've uh, put together uh, a very short presentation, but uh, per, perhaps a, a tricky one, uh, because I'm, I'm at the moment very much concerned about the, the motives for, for um, uh, working with, uh, with health equity and uh, uh, difficulties in um, uh, moving things forward. So, so at the Center for Epidemiology and, and Community Medicine, we're, we're 
supposed to be the link between evidence and, and statistics on, on uh, one side and um, uh, politics, policy and um, uh, clinical practice on, on the other. So that's like our, uh, our goal uh, to be this, uh, be this bridge. Um, and uh, and um, health equity is, is very much on the agenda, more and more so, um, perhaps paradoxically, because uh, for the last uh, seven years, we've had a right wing um, block in, uh, in, uh, in charge, uh, but still we, uh, there is more and more uh, focus on this, these issues. Um, I've been in um, uh, this field uh, actually for almost 20 years and I, I did my PhD at the Center for Health Equity Studies at Stockholm University. So I've been interested in, in these questions. What I'd like to uh, discuss with you today is um, these different uh, takes on, on health equity. And I want to start with this one on the, on the motives for um, uh, taking an interest in, in this topic. So it's, um, it's very clear to me that um, some people uh, active in the field of health equity are maybe not um, actually um, uh, after health e equity, but uh, uh, after economic equality. Or after economic equality as well. And, wh and why, is this, why is this important? Does it matter? Well, it does, because uh, there, are, there is a broader majority um, agreeing that health inequalities are a problem. Then, uh, the group agreeing that economic inequalities are a problem. So there are surveys showing this, that uh, health inequalities um, are uh, interesting more people than economic inequalities. So, so when we let our uh, interest in economic equality, like uh, when we mask that interest in, in terms of health, uh, inequality. Uh, that's not a very tactical thing to do, I think. Another uh, variation here, difference between uh, people, different sort of backdrop, is that some people are very um, engaged in the injustice of the, uh, of the health uh, inequalities, while others might be more interested in in the difference in health between socioeconomic groups, groups because what it might uh, help us understand about the uh, determinants of, of public health. So if uh, uh, married, highly educated women in, uh, in the rich part of Stockholm live uh, 10 years longer than the low educated men in, in the poorer neighborhoods, uh, there is, uh, I mean, the, it's not a wild idea to, to think that uh, uh, the health of, uh, of this privileged group should be attainable for all, right? So what can we learn from, from uh, studying these inequalities in terms of what actually determines health? And then there's maybe uh, a third um, motive here uh, or fourth, um, maybe not so much, I, I put it within brackets because um, I don't know about um, health inequalities, but this is definitely a motive in, for um, taking an interest in economic inequality. So when, when the Silicon Valley uh, CEOs of uh, uh, big companies in Silicon Valley talk about um, basic income, Maybe not because they are very concerned about the injustice, or, <laughs> but uh, 
but they they realize that uh, bigger and bigger inequalities will sooner or later uh, threat the system a system which they of course uh, dep depending on to keep making money and so on so uh, there's actually this um, possible motive as well um, closely related but but i think also um, in, in uh, some ways uh, independent of, of this um, variation in motives there are uh, variations in um, how you describe the problem so one needs to be a, a very critical actually a consumer of, of uh, health um, equity literature and you, and you have to um, make sure you understand whether you're looking at a, a snapshot or a secular trend, um, whether it's relative or absolute differences in health. If you look at the uh, contrasting groups at the, at the very end of the spectrum or uh, on the population as a whole. And to demonstrate the last, the last point, unfortunately, uh, these figures are in Swedish then because they're from our public health uh, report. But it's um, in the first one, it's uh, the relative risk of dying uh, within the next um, three years in, in four income groups. So there's actually a reference line missing here, you could say with, with the richest fifth, where that uh, per definition will have the relative risk of one then of dying. And what you see here is that the, the lowest uh, fifth the fifth with the lowest income, they are they are really uh, lagging behind. So they had a huge relative risk of dying uh, already in the beginning of the period, but it's increasing over time. Uh, but then there's two groups uh, in the middle of the population that's actually approaching the the richest twenty percent. You see that it's going from three point four and two to two point nine and one point seven. And all in all, in my next figure, it's like a, a population attributable fraction or how many, how big proportion of all deaths would be uh, avoided if everyone had a low uh, mortality of the, of the highest fifth. And then this like explanatory power of uh, income differences in, in mortality is actually going down. So in one way, inequalities are increasing in a dramatic sense. In another way, they are decreasing. All right. Uh, a more, um, some more variations. There are um, this uh, idea among uh, certain groups of uh, public health workers that. Uh, but sometimes it's like the, the best solution becomes a, an enemy of the, of the of a good solution. So uh, maybe lower if we had the lower blood pressure overall, um, the socioeconomic vulnerable groups would would benefit the most from this. One way of lowering blood pressure is to uh, actually blood pressure lowering drugs <laughs> that cost like three crowns a day. Uh, but uh, because we would like everyone to have uh, normal blood pressure, thanks to a, a healthy lifestyle, it, it's almost like we, we, we're not discussing other means of, of achieving this. Uh, there is also this uh, variation in whether you, you think that there are trade-offs. Is, uh, is equality sometimes... Um, is there a trade-off between equality and um, maybe average um, performance in some way? Uh, or do we even have to discuss it? Do we need, as in other fields, uh, to be evidence-based? Uh, do we need a randomized controlled trial or a natural experiment? Or is, for some reason, common sense uh, more applicable here? And as uh, Hannah actually was, was touching upon in her talk, uh, what is our roles here as uh, academics or public officials or 
MDs. And as you might have guessed, um, my take on, on all this is that I believe that improvements in, in health equity will come about faster if we if we find common ground and deal with economic inequality separately from from health uh, inequalities. If we are transparent about all improvements that are actually happening over time. So, so we don't write the thick reports where, where all figures are, are uh, uh, showing something that uh, uh, a trend that we are concerned with without um, uh, being transparent, uh, for example, about uh, health or um, um, life expectancy increasing for most groups, although at different speeds. I think improvements will come out faster if we stick to our evidence-based approach of, of doing stuff and hereby staying more clear uh, of politics. So in the Marmot Commission, for example, there were, there were uh, uh, suggestions, uh, policy implications uh, concerning uh, early uh, life interventions where there are uh, a huge amount of randomized controlled trials. But then on the next page, you could have a, a, a suggestion about to Tobin tax. Are, are there um, randomized controlled trials showing that a Tobin tax is a good uh, intervention? No, it it's becomes clear to everyone that it's more politics than, than, than evidence based. And then I think we need to wrap yes. it up. Yes, and this is, the, this is uh, the very last thing I had. So thanks. You're muted, head up. Thank, thank you. I'm so sorry to interrupt. It's it's very very interesting to listen to you. And thank you so much for a very interesting presentation, Anton and bring your perspective. Um, and I am very excited about the panel discussion to come. I feel we have so much uh, knowledge here and experiences of working with uh, health equity and inequities in health. Um, but first, I think we will take a short little health break before jumping into the discussion. So um, at 7.25, I give all of us seven minutes for stretching our legs, bringing a glass of water uh, and uh, get ready for the panel discussion. Uh, so see you in seven minutes. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, a big thank you to the, for all the presentations. And uh, we have prepared some questions uh, for the panel discussion. And maybe we could start with the social determinants, which we, some of you mentioned earlier during the presentations. Uh, so Miguel, maybe you could uh, start with answering this question. Uh, what are the most important social determinants for equal health conditions in Sweden compared to other countries around the world? Do you have any thoughts on this? Um, this one. Um, it's, a, yep. it's a quite complex question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, uh, well, if I have to just uh, summarize uh, or be brief and simple, maybe uh, I, I think the the, the, the most uh, crucial probably um, um, determinant is the political system that we have currently. Uh, a political system uh, globally quite uh, neoliberal, which is uh, favoring the richest people compared to the rest of the population. And that uh, uh, somehow reflects as well many of the policies that are uh, existing in this in this country so I, I think that the, the mother the, the the focus the cause of the causes is the political structure that we have uh, currently in the world and by uh, influence in Sweden too. yeah 
Yeah, thank you very much. Are there any other comments on the social determinants in Sweden? Do you have any thoughts on uh, which ones could be the most important? Most important, I would like to uh, uh, support Miguel a little bit on this, uh, that political system is important, but social determinants of uh, has, it would be the same all over the world. It's, it's my opinion, I, I might be wrong, but this is the situation, how people are born, how they um, grow up, go to education, which kind of food they can afford, uh, the working conditions, and um, all these determinants, um, they are, they would stand for better or worse health. And in Sweden, uh, like in the whole world, uh, these things exist. And so if you were born in a poor family in Sweden, you got uh, no education, you can't uh, afford to work in the good working condition, your health will not be good. These, I think, strong predictors all over the world. And if you're born in a good family that gave a good education, most likely you will further succeed with your health and the expectation of your life will be longer, um, uh, higher. So I, I think it's not any special Swedish style here. Uh, it's just like volume. I guess a volume is a little bit uh, different, not so much differences in the population in Sweden, like in many other countries, like say, you can say Ukraine, they're very rich people and very poor people. And uh, then you can say, well, there's pol polarity. In Sweden, probably this polarity is less pronounced. This is my opinion. But Anton probably is thinking something different. You, you mentioned that the politics is probably, should not uh, look at the politics. And uh, the, I, I have a question actually to you, Anton, very interesting uh, idea that you presented. I don't know if I understood it correctly, but you mentioned that one need to look at the um, uh, life condition of people separately from their health. Did I understand it right? Or uh, economic uh, factors separately or this uh, determinant separately from the, from, from the health? What oh. I meant is actually, uh, it's like, um... Um, I want to encourage uh, uh, fellow researchers in in uh, in this uh, area to uh, keep their like political um, opinion opinions about uh, equality in general separate from their work on on health inequalities because when when they don't, or when we don't, um, this uh, uh, this is seen by the politicians, and then the whole then the whole uh, area is is like um, it can be put, uh, set aside as as uh, social democratic uh, propaganda, right? Mm -hmm. So when when uh, I, I think my my uh, example from the Marmot Commission is is quite uh, um, elucidating actually. So when there is the, there are uh, sections on on preschool and, and so on where there are randomized controlled trials ultimately showing that it's a good thing to have a, a preschool of high quality. It will help uh, children and it will especially help children from uh, uh, rougher socioeconomic circumstances. Great. Then we're evidence based, and, and everything is is fine. But then on the next page, you, you have something like um, tax on properties. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's obvious that there's no uh, evidence in our uh, in medical journals that it's a good thing to have a property tax. Uh, all thinking people think uh, we should have property tax, but it's also a very political thing. And, and, and when you put the, those two suggestions next to each other, you make it too easy for, for the, uh, the, the right-wing half of uh, decision makers to just ignore the whole, uh, the whole problem. Discussion. Mm. Yeah. That's I understand fine. what you meant. Hmm? I, I, 
just to bring some de debate, but I disagree totally. I mean, I think uh, we should not, I mean, and at least our group here encourage the medical students, for instance, to, to get more and more involved in politics because they are very, um, their, their political training is very, very small and then they have to understand very well how politics work and how the ideology work and how much they are linked to to the to the healthcare system that we have and to the different outcomes that they are produced. I mean, it's, it's impossible to separate cause and effect. If we do that, that's the situation that we have now, that inequalities in health are increasing because we don't want to touch certain structures of the society that are producing those, those uh, social inequalities. And unless we put them together, uh, yeah, nothing is going to happen. I mean, to isolate health and separate it from from the from the politics, which is the the, the origin of all the health the of all the health inequalities, is um, yeah, I don't think it's the right strategy. But well, I could call it probably. Uh, I, I think what Anton uh, means here is not to engage into these political uh, parties' uh, games because uh, ultimately they just want to fight for power. But advocacy, in my opinion, is a different thing. Uh, the, the study that I showed, I did uh, solely for the purpose of advocacy because I am a molecular biologist. I'm not doing these kind of things really. Uh, it's basically my hobby, uh, this engaging in tuberculosis advocacy because uh, even though I'm a molecular biologist and I will be working uh, on a diagnostic test, I know that the best diagnostic test that I will manage to devise, it will not help to uh, the country uh, like the Ukraine, for example, because no one is not going to implement the test that I invented. Even if I had the best test in the world, it will not be implemented there until you push and push and push until you show these uh, uh, people who die who don't have access to the antibiotics. Uh, in, in Ukraine, for example, there have been thousands of people put on palliative care because their tuberculosis was super drug resistant. There exist medicines to help them, but uh, until recently, they didn't exist in the country. And so these people had to die of infectious disease, thousands of people. And that's a, a subject for advocacy. I, I mean, this is extreme. Of course, in Sweden, these kind of things do not happen. It's only like 25 people who die of tuberculosis in Sweden per year. So that's a completely different story. But I mean, as a concept, uh, you definitely should advocate. But on the other hand, uh, not to present yourself, I would say, as a representative of a certain party, because that would end up probably, as Anton say, some kind of uh, strange publications in the newspaper. <laughs> yeah, and also, I mean, so we're all in favor of uh, evidence-based policy. Uh, when, when we have um, the opposite, the, the policy, the policy-based evidence, uh, this is um, we don't get away with this. Hey, Miguel, you said inequalities are increasing. What inequalities? What what? Um, so I, I just showed you the trends from, from Stockholm. Uh, the poorest fifth are lagging behind, but all in all, the inequalities are decreasing and we're still only on the relative scale. If we look at the absolute um, differences, everything is becoming better. Uh, good for you. But uh, that's, uh, I mean, that's a small part of the country. I mean, if I show you data from Norland, I mean, say, yeah, the income inequalities are increasing. Uh, in many outcomes. So yeah. So what what are you showing me? Yeah. Oh, but yes. uh, all right. So, yeah. So this uh, actually leads us to one of our next questions: uh, the different parts of Sweden and uh, how does health and access to care differ across the land? Uh, so Hannah, maybe you could uh, have some comments on this. Um, yes, well, it's really interesting to uh, to follow the discussion, uh, I think, uh, and also interesting that um, we're not always streamlined, uh, makes it more interesting, doesn't it? Um, well, uh, I've been working now in a primary health care center in the rural part of Vesterbotten for three months compared to when I've been working um, in the primary health care center now in Umeå, central Umeå. And um, I mean, it's really interesting when you look at the Swedish law, the, the right to access health care and um, how it's supposed to be uh, equal and equitable. 
but uh, of course there are huge challenges to this um, and to see that um, uh, for example if I have a patient uh, with a cardiac arrest in the center of Umeå and compare that with the patient who is uh, in Schittelfjell um, or Storuman and uh, well by car it would take like perhaps five hours to get to Umeå University Hospital from Schittelfjell. Storuman is like three and a half hours. Um, yes, uh, sometimes you can use a helicopter, but then the weather condition must be right and you cannot have as many critical patients at the same time. So of course we have differences in the country, just looking at the regions and not even mentioning people uh, that might not access healthcare depending on the uh, legal status or if they are asylum seekers or uh, undocumented, um, EU migrants, etc. So, I mean, uh, for me, as a human rights trainer, health is a human rights. Uh, and we have also it restricted by law in Sweden. And um, I think we have a lot to discuss here also when prioritizing, for example, as uh, Miguel showed, uh, uh, what patients can actually access healthcare. Uh, is it the ones who really need it? Uh, or is it the people who are in a position to, to seek it and ask for it more? And who is it actually available for today? Um, so for me as quite a young doctor, I think uh, we have a lot of um, challenges ahead to really make sure that the, the most ill uh, get access to the healthcare. Yeah, and that that experience that you have had in 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 here in Storuman or or in Klimpfjell or or, or Lixele or wherever, then then you can you can I mean you can see it as well in population based studies because then when we when we see that I mean the people there is around 15 20 percent of the population that refrain to go to the healthcare because they cannot afford it. And there might be different reasons why they, they cannot afford it, but but when you somehow disaggregate those data, those in rural areas obviously are refrained much more. Those who are migrant migrants are refrained much more. Those who are Sami are refraining much more, and those who are poor refrain much more in both in absolute and relative terms. So that's that's what, how it's expressed later in the population-based studies too. And I mean, it's also interesting as it's so broad, uh, as we said, like all the different socioeconomic determinants in health. And uh, I mean, it's most individual for each person, what will affect your specific, specific health. You can go to yourself and think about it. And what barriers are there to healthcare for you? And I try to think about that with every single patient I meet. I mean, for some people, they go to healthcare centers every week or it's just a standard thing. And other patients, Perhaps they thought about going there for years, but they didn't know how to access or uh, they were afraid somehow they had a bad experience. There's so many different things to take into account also. And um, I mean, also to, to see the expectations uh, and fears of the patient in the clinical meeting. Uh, it's something that I would like really emphasize for students and, and other young doctors to take with them. Mm. I agree with you totally. And uh, this, what you mentioned, and Miguel, with the, our rural area, even small cities in the Norland, I am shocked by the fact that now they're closing the delivery department in Luxele. This is just a shock. In, in Sweden, a country that fights for uh, women, right? I don't understand how women are forced to deliver children in the middle of the forest, in the cars. Uh, I mean, I have only one child, but it was a big thing for me to deliver a child and I live close to the hospital. I can't imagine that that would be like 200 kilometers from the hospital that would help me to deliver a child. And I have to drive. I don't have a driving license. There is no buses going here. So my husband will have to be with me last two weeks on standby to drive me there. If I don't have a husband, if I have three children more, how is it supposed to be? And Sweden says, I mean, I come from Eastern Europe and I'm, I'm kind of uh, living a long time here still. Even in my country, uh, we don't talk about women's rights without rights to have a, a normal labor. We don't uh, deliver children in the forest. <laughs> so I think that's the, the really very sad situation that is happening here with the access to the healthcare for women in Norland. That's a disgrace.
Yeah, thank you for all these uh, different perspectives and uh, very interesting so, to hear some uh, clinical examples as well from you, Hannah. And uh, we talked a bit about the uh, migrants and uh, their health. Uh, Olena, do you have any thoughts on what the main challenges in migration health equity in Sweden is today? Migration, yes, of course, in terms of tuberculosis, we can say, if, uh, since this is close to my uh, area of study, um, I know the situation, the tuberculosis is mainly prevalent among migrants, and also it complicated because migrants don't have such a good access to healthcare due to the language uh, and uh, stigma is one of the things. One of your question was how to, what is the best uh, way to, um, provide really uh, equities and some diseases are worse than others because if I have for example uh, cancer is probably not so embarrassing if you have a tuberculosis so with cancer you go and seek help with tuberculosis you feel embarrassed and you don't know what's going to happen with you and you don't go and don't seek help so the stigmatization is one thing so in terms of uh, um, delivering the equity in the healthcare, then one probably should think about that that some diseases are less pleasant to talk about and also sexual transmission diseases uh, apart from tuberculosis who will go around and brag about syphilis or something like this uh, so um, these kind of things um, uh, definitely migrants uh, are, uh, have uh, complications but to continue on this i uh, what you mentioned in the different regions of the country i read this uh, report from 2017 and he clearly says that uh, also from full health among the heat and that uh, uh, some uh, the people who live in our region, they have uh, less access and psychological uh, mental health is a big issue. So that's documented and we of course shouldn't forget about this. The, also the Tornidal and this report, you know this report that uh, is uh, here, do you see it? It also touches upon Tornidal uh, Tornedalena. I don't know what they're called in, in English, but this is a part of the population living in the north. And these people associate the access to the healthcare through their language because they still use, I have a couple of friends who speak this language uh, with their family, but uh, they speak Swedish outside. So some older people probably uh, have some certain issues with this. And since they're, they're not even migrants, they're Swedish people living here. And I think that probably they should have some um, support in their language in that sense. I think Anton wanted to add something. Yes, I'm, I'm um, taking my role as the devil's attorney very seriously. So I, I have to point out two things. One is um, that before we, we, we have written extensively on, uh, on COVID-19 now, uh, three reports uh, demonstrating the, the huge socioeconomic differences. But, and, and also differences by um, country of birth. But before COVID-19, being born abroad was related to lower risk of dying in Stockholm. So contrary to many, uh, many uh, people's ideas, uh, and probably because uh, you know, we only accept this, the strong, um, strong uh, it's only the healthy and strong that make it here. Uh, the other thing I want to uh, point your attention to, and I don't know how it is uh, in in Norland or or in other regions, but but in Stockholm we are like uh, the leading region in consuming healthcare. So we have um, we have much more uh, visits, outpatient uh, visits than than the rest of Sweden, despite the fact that we are um, healthier younger and uh, you know uh, on average um, the the most visits are among those with low socioeconomic status so it's not like it, it we, we can get the impression that that rich people are or highly educated people are having more visits to healthcare than uh, that's not the case so uh, you you um, you can still demonstrate that uh, access is unequal, 
if you adjust for uh, self-rated health, for example. Right. So when you take the, the health into consideration, you get this gradient that uh, that um, people with high socioeconomic status over consume or, or the other way around that, that there's uh, a lower access. But in absolute terms, this is not the case. <laughs> so the, the most healthcare is consumed among those with low education. And in Stockholm, where we uh, consume a lot of healthcare, it, it's difficult to, to think uh, perhaps of this as the, our number one problem, that there are groups that don't have enough access. I don't know. The, do think? I think that what you're saying is completely uh, um, logical that they go, the low social economic people go to the um, uh, people with a low social economic origin come to doctors because I think they you might have even lower uh, has, again, I'm not the expert in this, but uh, what I see in Ukraine is exactly the same. They go to the doctors, people who live unhealthy lifestyle, people who have very good education, understand about their health, and this also reflected in uh, several reports that I saw. They uh, don't need to go to the doctor because uh, from uh, through whole history of their life, their health care has uh, been improved by good lifestyle, the food that they eat, good work condition. They don't have... Uh, back problem like someone who is loading uh, 10 uh, cars of some kind of uh, goods and stuff they don't have to go to the doctor because of this so that's logical to me what you say absolutely um, no hannah would like to say something yeah well I, I think it's interesting i would love to see how it is in in our region i mean i, I don't really know about stockholm but um uh I, I had a question if it's also like looking into private uh, healthcare, consuming of private healthcare, or if it's only um, the regions. That, that's one question, like these specific data. And secondly, well, I've been working uh, quite a lot um, with um, like volunteer health clinics in Sweden, both with the Red Cross and uh, Doctors of the World. And like we meet a lot of people from specific groups uh, that have difficulties in accessing healthcare. Um, and also that there is uh, a lack of knowledge from healthcare staff sometimes, um, uh, knowing what rights these specific people have actually. Um, so they are not getting access to healthcare because um, uh, someone in the reception does not know how to register a person without a Swedish um, ID number or uh, Perhaps they don't know that in some regions in Sweden, uh, asylum seekers has the same right to health care as, as anyone, but in other regions, uh, they don't, because now it's, it, differs on, it differs on a regional level. So, I mean, uh, I would love to see actually more about how it is in our region, and I will check it out. And um, yeah, if you could uh, add comment on that, if it was also included in private health care, and it would be interesting. I it's it's that you're definitely onto something about uh, so what's um, much of uh, the reason why we are consuming so much healthcare in, in Stockholm is is because of visits to private specialists uh, and and of course that you are able to uh, refer yourself to to specialist private doctors in, in so many areas. Um, and, and of course, there's a strong socioeconomic gradient in, in who does, do, does that then. Um, and of course, there are uh, uh, horrible problems of um, the, the most vulnerable groups in society not having access at all to, to healthcare. That, that's obvious. But it's, um, so may, maybe it's like a similar situation to to the one on, on income, we, we're like, um, um, we have groups, it's becoming more, more polarized. So for a lot of, of uh, the population, it, things are becoming better and we're also becoming more equal to each other. But then there's, there's group on, on the extreme that are actually being uh, completely left, left behind. And that's, that's not sustainable. Um, it's maybe not that strange either. So Johan Mackenbach has, uh, was a, a prominent researcher in, the, in this field. He has uh, argued that 
So most of our societies, even if we we you know we have this uh, we have social democrats uh, for four years and then we have the uh, uh, right wing or center, uh, but still uh, societies run by parties representing um, everyone, but uh, but the most vulnerable. So no one loves the the poor and the, uh, you know the poor and the sick and and, and what's happening. Uh, uh, is that the, yeah the many for many for big groups in society things are actually becoming uh, better and better and also they're approaching each other but there is this uh, group on the on the bottom being left behind maybe it makes sense because they're not represented in our political systems I'm not saying that it's good, but that it makes sense. I just wanted to lift, like, uh, I feel there are a few of, um, like, Hans Rosling's possibilistic uh, um, aspects in what you are saying. And, like, yes, if we look historically, um, Sweden has come a long way uh, when we look at healthcare. Um, but what I see also is that uh, it's difficult to, um, to conduct research um, in a good way and really include uh, data from specific vulnerable groups still in Sweden, like to get this evidence, which is needed uh, to actually form the right policies. And I know it's something that we we might all be aware of. And I think that um, we have to, to work more with this and also to be better at including um, people from different groups uh, and minorities when uh, uh, shaping research projects in general. I agree with you also, and I think uh, the, this other um, uh, study that I uh, took a look at, it's called Next Step Towards More Equity in Health in Sweden. How can we close the gap in generation by Ule Lundberg from the Department of Public Health Science, Stockholm University. So this guy uh, argues that, uh, as you say, the measurement of uh, inequities is still not addressed fully. So some, some area also like Antal says some group of people may be not even uh, included in the um, measurements and there is no systematic assessment of how their health is and, and depending on which factors. So I, I don't really know what's going on in establishing those uh, tools for measurement, um, but it seems like several committees has been established. So probably these committees will uh, uh, approach uh, the tools or design the tools that must be something ongoing. Or maybe Miguel would know more about that. Sorry, hmm? Ola. maybe Miguel yes, would know more about Miguel, that. ah, yes. Well, uh, no, I think, um, again, I think this was a very good report. Uh, I think uh, the report, um, if I remember well, was mostly based on issues related to education. Income was a bit uh, hardly touched, for instance. Uh, I think it has good recommendations, but one, one, one thing is the recommendations. Another thing is what the politicians will take from that recommendation. So, so I think it was commissioned by uh, the government in order to, but uh, I don't think the government um, has care enough about that document. I was thinking uh, maybe we could move on to another question, if that's okay with everyone. I was, uh, I was very interested to hear, uh, and you've touched upon this, like you, we're, we've discussed it a bit, I think, but I'd like to hear more of your thoughts about the question about what health promotion health promoting interventions make the most difference for individuals possible health uh, and where you think we should focus our uh, public health efforts i suppose and uh, I, I you all have different fields right so i, I i'm not really sure <laughs> whom to ask to start i'd be curious to hear what anton has to say We, we are very much um, in, inspired or uh, um, affected by, by the uh, estimates from the Global Burden of Disease uh, project. So 
um, and what's very clear there is is that um, uh, although only five to ten percent uh, of Stockholmers are now smoking, uh, smoking is still uh, responsible for ten percent of all um, dollars, you know the the disease and, and premature mortality. And of course, uh, the in 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 the um, as uh, smoking is becoming less and less common, it's becoming more and more uh, socioeconomically uh, graded. So, I mean, when uh, when we ban smoking, uh, who will uh, um, benefit the most from that? Uh, the socioeconomic vulnerable groups. But then, then I would also like to. Um, to stress the importance of the cardiometabolic uh, risk factors. So we, we talk about this, this access to healthcare and you know, the inequalities there. Uh, when is that re really a problem? Well, when, when there is uh, evidence, uh, evidence showing that uh, consuming healthcare will actually make a difference. So, and now I'm being uh, tough, but for a lot of conditions like pain, <laughs> uh, from low, lower back pain and neck pain and so on, uh, things on the very top of the global burn of disease uh, list, also in Sweden and in Stockholm, uh, there's not much uh, evidence demonstrating that it makes a big difference. But for, for the cardiometabolic risk factors, this is, uh, uh, really uh, important, of course. Uh, it, uh, it it would be nice if if we detected more than half of all uh, high blood pressures. And again, uh, when when we have uh, fixed this embarrassing problem that you that you still uh, risk risk dying from from high blood pressure uh, today. Who will have benefited the most? Well, the socioeconomic vulnerable groups. Um, and and uh, yeah, I'm a bit from uh, health promotion as you as you hear, but uh, definitely disease prevention. Thank you. So would anyone else like to comment as well, or would you rather I pick another question? <laughs> Yeah, I think, well, I, I don't remember exactly the question, but the question was about if we believe that uh, health promotion interventions are useful. Definitely, I could think that they are useful. But I think as well, the most, uh, uh, while we know quite a lot about certain how, I mean, what things work for what, uh, what for what problems, uh, we know very little about what kind of interventions work for decreasing the health inequalities. Uh, and then usually, partly because, I think, partly because, the, I mean, the programs or health interventions, when they are planned and promoted and implemented, they don't consider those kind of factors uh, at all. So the, the, they are thinking more mostly on, on decreasing or increasing, um, decreasing Ill, Ill health or decreasing health, but they don't think much. They are not implemented or planned, basically, for trying to reduce the gaps. And therefore, when uh, the, it's you, so these interventions are evaluated, then yeah, you will see hopefully that something has improved, but definitely still the gap, usually in many of the interventions is still that, the, the socioeconomic gap. So that, that's, uh, that's one of the challenges that we have in public health. I just would like to remind the positive example of this intervention in Westerbotten. Uh, Hanna, you know, this is our Westerbotten studio that uh, in the 80s, when the people in Westerbotten were found to have a lot of uh, cardiovascular diseases, it had been uh, implemented a broad program where uh, at 40, 50, 60 uh, years old, people would go to the healthcare and um, get a survey about their uh, health habits and how they can improve and also they've been uh, giving blood samples. So that actually improved. And um, uh, since then, the um, uh, heart attacks uh, diminished, as I know, in the region. So that's kind of definitely amazing thing. And it, it was uh, um, 
stor satsning, how you say, um, uh, large investment, but I think it paid off because people started to be healthy and work better. Just great, I support. But they were not able to reduce the socioeconomic inequalities, just for you to know. No, that's definitely not because it was targeted specifically, uh, this intervention was specific towards the lifestyle, but uh, uh, the social economic inequalities, they wouldn't uh, be affected by that, definitely not. No, the socioeconomic inequalities in health, I mean, I mean, they still, despite, no. I mean, the, the low educated and the gap in between the low educated yeah. and in those lifestyle factors is still the same. Uh, as they were when they started the program. But I think it is like this, that they say uh, they've been, even in 80s, there have been uh, people with good social economic determinants and uh, less good social economic. Character. And if you start applying all these interventions to these people, so these ones move a little bit towards the improvement in these ones, but uh, the gap between them that has to do with social economic determinants will remain. That That's also logical. So that's another thing that should be addressed. It's not the same, but... Um, the different times, types of intervention. Also, interestingly, only 20% of the, the, the deaths um, supposed to be prevented was from cardiovascular disease. That's also food for thought. It's targeted towards those risk factors, but for some reason, 80% of the prevented deaths are from other reasons, other causes. So you think it was a, a wrong area that has been targeted? I, I just find it, I find it difficult to, to understand how, how this discussion about uh, nickel hole smacked food will prevent uh, me from dying from accidents or, or suicides and so on. But uh, I'm happy to be proven wrong. Well, I, I think there should be programs that are directed on different things. Um, how, how, uh, you, to die the accident in the, uh, for example, bicycle um, crash or something, and probably there should be an intervention on people using uh, helmets and things. I, I think these are different things, different aspects of multifaceted uh, issue. Yeah, no, definitely. Not... It's just that the, the evaluation of um, of the, the, the VIP intervention uh, they, they conclude that uh, most of the deaths are not from cardiovascular disease and they think of this as a strength and I'm not very I'm not convinced it's a strength if you if you talk about cardiovascular okay. risk factors then you might suspect expect cardiovascular disease to decrease but but not uh, uh, all other causes of death Perhaps it's a bit difficult to follow for um, people who have not read these studies, but I think what is interesting to take away is that like, you have to be critical when you plan an intervention. You have to also plan the evaluation at the same time from the very start. Uh, and also you have to be critical reading conclusions from a specific uh, intervention or study um, and see if you from the same data will, will find the same conclusions or not. Just as a giveaway that I started to think more about as quite new as a researcher and PhD student, and there might be other students listening into this. Um, and I mean, it's always good to to discuss with other researchers, like, was this the best way of doing it? Or um, can we really t take these conclusions with us from this specific study? Um, and uh, yeah, perhaps we can share some of the links to some of the studies later if uh, people would be interesting to, to look more into it. I think that sounds fantastic and I hope we could, uh, we could all stay in a, a couple of extra minutes so I could, uh, uh, <laughs> so I can jot down all of the names of the studies that we've mentioned. Uh, so we have a short list for people. Uh, that'd be great, I think. But I, I have one example where I have to contradict Anton, where I think that health and politics very well go together and where, where we've seen um, a huge difference for a specific group of people. And um, it was this change in, in regional politics in 2016 or 17, when um, uh, undocumented people and asylum seekers uh, got the same right to healthcare as, as all other um, uh, people living in Vestabotten. And I mean, for me as a clinician, 
not being able to to make sure that a pregnant woman will get her um, checkups or tell someone that no, um, it's not seen as urgent care in this region, so you will have to pay for your delivery. And if they cannot do that, I mean, once again, from a human rights perspective, it's 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 awful. It's it's such a huge ethical stress uh, working in such a condition because you see how it affects the individual. And um, I don't have any data on exactly how many people uh, we have uh, uh, changed the access and availability to health for with this specific reform. Um, but at least for me as a clinician meeting the patients, it makes my work easier to make sure that they access healthcare, which I guess is, is my part of this whole structure. Um, so for me, a, a good example where, uh, where also you can advocate uh, from a specific uh, point of view as a clinician or, or as a public health um, expert in different ways. Uh, and then it also becomes politics, right? Not saying that we should um, uh, try to polarize or not work together from different fields, but uh, I think it's important to also raise your voice and uh, and see when you can make a, a difference when things do not seem right. I agree. Well, obviously, but but then there's a. Uh, um... I mean, uh, an endless amount of evidence showing that uh, assisted birth is uh, a clever thing, right? So there, I would say it would. It's not. Um, you would you would not be like transcending your uh, responsibility as uh, academician or uh, academic or uh, public official. Or it's when we it's when we don't have evidence and and we base our uh, statements more on. Uh, uh, our uh, political convictions, then the, uh, I mean, of course, that's very important as well. But then we have to do it as politicians, not as people um, presenting evidence. Yeah, I, th I think I hear what you're saying. You've been you've been saying uh, for quite some while that uh, uh, there is always a risk of being interpreted as someone uh just stating a political opinion when you are uh, actually presenting uh academic findings and things that are maybe scientifically proven beneficial and maybe in media and from certain politicians they have a tendency to decide which one you are depending on what point of view suits them um and, and that's, uh, of course, different from. Uh, and it's bad for the cause. It's bad for our work in uh, reducing health inequalities. Let's see. Uh, do we have? Did we have any questions from the uh, <clears throat> from the chat for the panel? I have dropped out inadvertently because of uh, network struggles. So I cannot back in the chat. So I'll have to pass that one to Agnes. Yeah, no question right now, but we had uh, some question from before, uh, more focusing on research. And uh, since this is a very difficult topic in many ways, as we heard today, uh, it's important to think about the ethics and how to do research on the more vulnerable groups in an ethical way. And uh, maybe Miguel, you have some uh, thoughts on this with your experience? Well, yeah, I mean, the, uh, I, I mean, how to do that? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it's just, I mean, no, I don't know. I, I, I think uh, we should be very, as you said, very respectful about the other and think quite a lot about the, about the other, trying to understand that, that, that other person. I mean, it, it, uh, if we go with that attitude of respect, uh, I think, uh, I mean, yeah, the, the, the other things will, will come. So I think that's, that's the, 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 the essential that we try to understand uh, whatever is going to be that other, no? the person that we want to increase the knowledge about. Mm 
Yeah, any thoughts from uh, any of the other? Yeah, can I add something? Um, I, I just um, was uh, contacted by um, a research group and they wanted to conduct a specific um, program for migrants just arriving in Sweden, but um, for specific treatments. Uh, and they thought that this might be beneficial for this specific group. And um, like trying to to explain for this group that this uh, this is a group of people just arriving in Sweden um, and then approaching them with a specific treatment as healthcare staff. Um, of course, it, it gives uh, a lot of, of difficulties and things to take in into consideration. Um, especially if uh, uh, this group has not had the, the chance to meet any health professionals yet in Sweden. Um, uh, so this might be their first uh, uh, checkup or first meeting with healthcare at all. Uh, and well, as it's not uh, the same situation in all countries, uh, they might not have had that chance for quite some time. Uh, so, of course, we have really to think about what group do we have in front of us, um, what knowledge and experience do they have, what, which culture do they come from, um, and how can we justify to make such a study on this group, what are really the benefits for them, and uh, like from my experience to, to bring people uh, from different groups uh, who are knowledgeable and um, also about the, the local cultures or the local environment um, and work together with them. Uh, also as a part of the decolonized global health movement in, in general uh, and bringing back the question I, I asked myself in the beginning, I mean, who am I in the field of research? Um, I can bring into some things, I can study, I can take courses. Um, I'll still have my biases and, uh, and my view of the world. So uh, yeah, to to work together and, uh, as you said, Miguel, to, to come with uh, respect, definitely. And when you work with a specific minority groups, that, I mean, that respect as well takes a lot of time because, I mean, it requires a, a process of, of communication, a process of discussion, a process of understanding. And I mean, if I think or reflect a little bit on the work we have been doing now with the with the Sami people, I mean, it take us it took us a couple of years to 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 to, to reach some kind of understanding uh, and discussions at different levels at the at the community levels at the, uh, like organizational levels or at even political levels with the with the Sami parliament. So so I mean, all these. Yeah, kind of processes uh, are necessary whenever you work with with uh, particular vulnerable populations. Thank you very much for that. Uh, maybe we need to wrap up now. If, I just and, may uh, I say one thing? Yeah, uh, just to, to to comment on what Hannah said about the. Uh, the uh, challenges in ethics uh, that doctors sometimes have faced, and I have a couple of friends who wrote this article I posted in the in the chat. They work in UK, and then in in 2014 in UK there have been changes in the legislation who to charge or not to charge for the healthcare, and so uh, it appeared that a large proportion of the um, foreigners would be charged for the help with uh, uh, with their um, potential tuberculosis diagnostic and treatment. And so these guys, they look at the um, um, delay in the diagnosis uh, in, in the, before the, the new legislation and after, and that actually they saw the extension. So it was not, uh, uh, the, the, there was a delay in, in time to diagnosis in these groups. So there is like uh, not only ethical problems, but uh, uh, which they absolutely face, these guys, my friends, but also the um, factors connected to the um, infection disease severity and transmissibility because the longer the person is sick, more transmission can occur, the uh, more advanced say tuberculosis will be and more uh, uh, extended treatment would be needed probably and that also costs money all these uh, uh, activities. So 
the politics also has a role here and that should be taken in consideration which kind of decision for would affect vulnerable groups will be taken. Yeah, thank you for those finishing words. And now uh, it's time to end the panel discussion soon. So I was just uh, want to give a few words to each and every one of you uh, to wrap up uh, the discussion. And if you have uh, something small to add before we end for tonight. So Hannah, do you want to say something? Um, well, just to keep in mind that it's complex with health equity and um, try to analyze what barriers are present in a specific situation, uh, barriers to healthcare, as we went through in the beginning. Um, and to stay evidence-based, I guess, uh, with our um, within our profession, uh, then again, I can recommend a health equity course at the Department of Epidemiology at the OMU University, which I think was really a food for thought. Um, so, uh, if you're interested in this uh, topic, uh, you can apply to that course. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Miguel, any finishing words? I think your clinical work in the future, I mean, will be much more enriched and you will have a much more uh, deep perspective and understanding of the patient if you are able to connect your clinical work with research, particularly research on, uh, on social inequalities in health. That's my word. Yeah, thank you very much. And Anton? Yes, um, speaking of the last topic we touched upon here, uh, uh, dealing with um, special vulnerable groups and, and so on, I just want to re remind us that there is a, um, a different setting when we do um, public health work. So, so if someone shows up at the ER with uh, 37 uh, knife uh, wounds. Um, we need to do something uh, from from a, like an ethical perspective, irrespective of of the evidence, right? So even if there's no RCT showing that we can help you, uh, we have to do something. There's an imperative. But when we uh, when we're talking about uh, groups or people that might not even uh, agree that they are subjects or, or at risk, there is a much, much, the stakes are much, much higher. Then we really need to have solid, solid evidence that, that what we're doing uh, when we're intervening or um, 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 uh, barging in on their autonomy and, and so on, uh, that, we're, that what we're doing is, uh, is uh, uh, improving their health. So just a reminder that the stakes are higher in in public health than in uh, emergency healthcare. Yeah, thank you very much. And last but not least, Elena, do you have anything? Just in short. I think I already said what I wanted. So thank you very much for um, this very interesting discussion, I learned a lot. And Miguel, I would be happy to talk more to you about SAMI because I'm interested how it's tuberculosis is within SAMI population. Yeah, nobody knows. Yeah, so, so maybe it's thank a you. for research. Yeah, thank you to all uh, of our panelists. Uh, just uh, some last words from uh, Hedda. Yes, thank you. Let me share my screen again. Um, here we are. <laughs> well, um, I want to say a big thank you to the whole panel and also the, the audience uh, for this very enriching and uh, exciting discussion. I'm, 
I'm very inspired and um, happy to have listened to, to all of your presentations and the discussion. Um, I also, uh, we want to thank you from our organization's side. We want to thank you uh, by giving a donation of money to Doctors of the World. Um, and uh, um, so normally when we have like physical uh, seminars, we give a flower, but it feels better this time to donate it to an organization that does a lot of good work. Um, yes, and also I want to do some um, uh, propaganda <laughs> uh, um, for the rest of the Global Health Week that is actually two weeks this year. Um, and as I said before, the theme is global or like health equity. And we have one exciting seminar tomorrow, a lunch seminar. Why Global Health with Helena Friedlingsdorf Lundqvist um, and also on Thursday on Decolonizing Global Health. And next week we have uh, about the global burden of disease and how uh, the health is affected uh, by where in the world you live. And also the 20th uh, next week, uh, we have a lunch seminar on uh, SAPMI Health and the cultural understanding in in healthcare. So um, with those words, I want to say a big thank you again to the panel. And uh, I really look forward to, um, to meet you again and collaborate on other mm, events and seminars in the future. Thank you very much. And also um, a last reminder, please uh, all those reports that you have uh, been talking about today, uh, please send them to global uh, global Helsa, Halsa. I can write the email address in the chat here, uh, so that we can upload them to the event, so people can um, take a look at those reports that you were talking about. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, well, I'm gonna just write that. And also, um, we have an info evening about our organization, the 28th 8th of October. Uh, you're most welcome to join. Okay, thank you so much and have a, a nice evening.